In this video, we're going to be exploring my rather complex electromechanical robot project. We're going to explore the mechanical engineering, software design, electronics, pneumatics, and fabrication techniques. All right, let's hit it. Okay, so in the other room over there, there's a robot and it's really pissed. There it is. Oh, it's coming this way. It's looking at us. Here we come. Ah! This thing means business. It really is trying to kill me. Ah. Yeah. So my initial efforts to control this robot were pretty basic. First I created a mnemonic scripting language that would allow me to do pre-programmed movements and firing patterns. I also created a joystick jog box to enable Gonzo manual mode. Lots of fun, but not terribly intelligent. Over the last six months, I've started to hear a lot about TensorFlow and Google's Coral Accelerator as ways that even the common man could start playing around with advanced AI and vision systems. This really intrigued me, but I was very intimidated as I'm not like the monster programmer. Until I found a YouTube video by a guy who calls himself Edge Electronics, E-D-J-E. -E. This tutorial really made me feel like there was a chance that I could do this myself. So I watched the tutorial and followed it, and within about an hour I actually had object recognition working, which was totally thrilling to me. All the code in the robot so far has been written in C. I'm a halfway decent C programmer. But the TensorFlow Lite object classification and object detection script is all written in Python. So that was a little bit of an uphill climb. I had to learn just enough Python to be able to extract the data that I needed and then pipe it to my C program where I could comfortably operate. At that point, it was pretty easy to start getting motors to turn and bullets to fire under the authority of a neural network and an artificial intelligence. Pretty cool. The TensorFlow system outputs a list of objects that it's detected. Each detection contains three different data values. The first one is what's called the class. The second one is the confidence. The third one is the bounding box. So when we receive a detection from the software, what we do first is we look at the class and we say, is this the kind of object that we're looking for? In our case, I'm looking for persons. So what we do is we just check that this is the right class of object. It could be a teddy bear, it could be a coffee cup. I'm looking for persons. Then we look at the confidence level and we say, how confident are we that this is the right thing that it's detected. So we threshold this to make sure that 
we only act on good data. Then we take this bounding box, which is a simple output, which is coordinates of what it sees on the screen. If the software detects an object, it's going to output the coordinates of the bounding box. So these coordinates are going to be x1, y1 for this one. And this one is going to be x2, y2. Simple coordinates on an x, y axis. Now, what we want to do is center this person. We want the guns to be shooting right at them. So what we need to do is figure out how do we get the robot to turn to put this object always in the center, both horizontally and vertically. What we do is we take the center by calculating the simple equation, x1 plus x2 over 2 equals the center. So what we really want to do then is offset it so that 0 comma 0 is right in the center. So we have a positive value for x and a negative value depending on how far away it is from the center. Same thing for going vertically. So if we create a signal like this that has a positive and negative value and we feed that signal directly to our stepping motor that can turn one way or the other and cause the robot to move. This signal, if we send it as a velocity, means then that if it sees this person off center to the right, it's going to create a positive output signal that will cause the motor to turn to move the person closer to the center. Therefore, the velocity will decrease until it converges on centered in x and y. So then if we take these values and we threshold them and say, OK, when the values are very close to 0, the object is centered, then we can fire. If you've watched this video up to this point, you're probably thinking, that's pretty cool. But you're also asking yourself, why? I wanted to create an installation artwork that provides a real, visceral, tangible experience of one potential robotic future. Not the cute and fluffy robot future, but one where robots are your potential adversaries and may even try to shoot you. My robot is physically modeled after a bacteriophage. It's a type of virus that uses bacteria as its host. It's really not alive. It's more like a machine, as all viruses are. I liken the balls that my robot shoots to some type of DNA packet, like a sperm, some delivery mechanism for sinister genetic information. Like any good red-blooded American male, I grew up fascinated with pellet guns, BB guns, ping pong ball cannons, spud launchers, anything that launched a projectile was utterly fascinating to me. At first I started playing around with bits of PVC pipe and rubber and various elements trying to create an air pulser that would recycle automatically and reliably produce really clean shots of air to propel the balls. The secret to this whole air pulser is this 3D printed sliding valve. It has a little rubber seat at the bottom that seals against the end of this tube. When it gets pressurized inside, this little chamber, tiny volume behind, also gets pressurized. The O-ring seals it here. And when this chamber is depressurized through this quick release valve, it causes the air pressure inside to quickly push the whole valve back which uncorks the tube and fires the ball. Once I had this working, the next step was to design in CAD a mechanism that could chamber, fire, and recycle the balls automatically. It needed to have a sensor so the computer could tell when a ball had been fired and when a new one had been chambered. It also needed to have an air cylinder that could cycle the bolt back and forth. 
I designed this to be 3D printed as two halves that would bolt together while clamping all the other parts in place. A piece of brass tube with a rod stuck through the side forms the bolt. It's easy enough to make this kind of stuff just with a hacksaw files and a drill and some solder. It was super fun to do the CAD part of this project. It's a real challenge to try to stuff as much function into two simple parts as possible. And the reward is when you come up with an idea that really works and integrates everything nicely. At one point when I was testing this all out, I shot myself in the hand accidentally and man did that hurt. I realized I needed to create some kind of pressure control system for the guns. And it would be also really cool to be able to set the pressure in software. So I set about trying to figure out how to do that. I found a small 12 volt solenoid valve that I could switch fast enough to make it into a PWM pressure regulator. I combined it with a pressure sensor and a microcontroller and made a PID controlled pressure control system that I can just set to any pressure and it will ramp it right up and hold. A lot of clicking and chattering is involved but it works really well. To get this little 12 volt solenoid valve to open and close as quickly as possible, I designed a custom driver that hits it with 24 volts, double its rated voltage. It drives it with a constant current so it doesn't overheat. And when it switches off, the coil energy is dumped into a 75 volt clamp, which substantially increases the rate of current decay. This little trick helps the valve perform at its maximum possible speed. This thing has a voracious appetite for balls. I needed to create some way to feed this thing balls fast enough so that it would never choke out for lack of balls. I found an ice bucket that seemed about right. This thing holds about 500 balls and is lightweight and very easily modified. In CAD, I designed a rotating feeder and agitator that uses a DC motor to feed balls out of two holes in the bottom of the drum. They basically fall through the holes as the drum rotates. A pair of red lasers and phototransistors counts the balls as they drop through the holes in the bottom of the feed drum. This allows the DC motor to control precisely how many balls are fed. The motor is simply stopped when the count reaches the desired amount. The drive motor mounts on an aluminum plate that has a bunch of holes laser cut into it that are just a few tenths of a millimeter larger than the balls. This prevents cracked, dented, or generally messed up balls from making it into the feeding mechanism and jamming things up. When you're designing any kind of feeding mechanism, it's always important to make sure that the path that the objects take drives the design and should never be an afterthought. So here in CAD, I made a 3D sketch that defines the path that the balls take from feed drum to gun barrel, and that drives the whole CAD design. Three D printing is great. Everyone loves it, but it really sucks when you try to make something that's really big or needs to be really strong or really cheap, for that matter. Sheet metal is the magic. Many of the structural and decorative parts of the robot are made out of two millimeter thick 1050 series aluminum that's laser cut to net shape. Along the bend lines, I cut out rows of slots that remove about 80% of the material along these lines. This creates a natural weak point where the metal wants to bend easily. 
This makes it super easy to fold these parts up into their final shape without any fancy tools. I just use blocks of wood and C-clamps to do the bending work. And when I get it all finely bent into the right position, screw it together, they're typically accurate to within less than a millimeter. It's a great system for making accurate, cheap, and fast parts. The key to working with sheet metal is to have a CAD package that has a sheet metal module built into it. This makes figuring all the tricky stuff out effortless. The mechanics of the robot are extremely simple. It's just two sets of ball bearings mounted at 90 degrees to each other to provide pan and tilt motion capabilities. They're both driven by stepper motors through one fifth inch pitch tooth timing belts. The pulleys have a ratio of 5.25 to one. That means the large pulley is 126 teeth, which is a damn big pulley. It's actually about 20 centimeters in diameter, not something you're gonna find off the shelf. I ended up having to make my own pulley by laser cutting some aluminum discs and 3D printing toothed inserts that fit around the outside of the disc forming the actual teeth. A simple but elegant way to make large diameter pulleys that are very accurate and reasonably cheap. The robot's head mimics the icosahedral shape of the bacteriophage itself. This of course is made up out of sheet metal using the sheet metal module in my CAD program. I first created a wireframe of the basic shape that I want and made sure that my feed drum would fit inside of it. Then I started to plaster it with surfaces, which I then converted to solids, and then into sheet metal objects. Once they were sheet metal objects, I could add flanges and cut them all out and get them to fit perfectly with all the bend allowances pre-calculated. The only tricky part about assembling it was making sure that I got all the components bent to the right angles. I had to carefully compare all the bends to a protractor to make sure that it went together nicely when I assembled it. I had to also tap a shit ton of screw holes to get it all ready to go. Once I was done with that, it went together really nicely. Like so many creative projects, I didn't know exactly where all this was going when I started. I wanted to make sure I didn't back myself into any really stupid corners, especially with the wiring. If you've ever built something electromechanical with moving wiring, you know how much of a pain that can be. Each function block gets 24 volts and connects to an RS-485 communication network. These function blocks should be fairly self-contained. That way, the only communication on the bus is high-level commands and things that are not incredibly time critical. This approach keeps the wiring fairly minimal and allows you to mount anything just about anywhere and get it connected up without having to go back to the drawing board. Next steps for this project. Change the Raspberry Pi to a Raspberry Pi 4 speed up the vision and uh, tracking part of it, package everything, and then try to find a gallery that's bold enough to show it. So my channel has grown a lot in the last three months and I really sincerely thank you all for helping me do that. So please like and subscribe, let's grow this even more. Thank you very much.